Thank you. Thank you. I do appreciate I the warmth a, of your welcome. Can I give you a hug? <laughs> when we get up a little bit, the decades seem to take a hold of us, but we defy them. <laughs> Refuse to be defied, but defined by them. But thank you for the warmth of your welcome. It was just wonderful coming into this place today, just to so sense God is in your midst. And I want to say never take that for granted because it is a wonderful thing that God is doing. And um, I am so glad that I'm still alive for this time. Amen. Because Amen. I believe we are in an incredible time in the economy and the plan of God. And we are actually walking in a biblical narrative, which I think is absolutely amazing. Yes. And some of our ancestors have dreamed of such a day that we are beginning to see where God is pouring out his spirit yes. on all flesh. Yeah. And we are part of that. And so is New Zealand. Isn't that amazing? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And Greymouth and every every place in the West Coast. God has a plan and a destiny for you. And I believe what the Spirit of the Lord is doing today, he's inviting us to be part of the incredible plan that he has. And I've put my hand up for that, have you? Yes, amen. I said, oh God, it is really amazing what you're doing. And um, actually, Glenn just alerted me to an announcement in the newspaper this week that Pope Francis has advocated that their priests should not speak for more than eight minutes because otherwise the people will go to sleep. <laughs> God help us. <laughs> God help us. But I, I do carry in my heart, having really tasted of it in, 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 in another kind of um, situation, um, the desire for revival and for rain. And God has really promised that, that you know, we will see such an outpouring. And I always and dreamed about, and I continue to dream, about the place that God has already spoken about his plan for New Zealand about it being a country that shall send many from the uttermost parts of the earth will go right back to what he really, really has and, and, and the plan and his purpose for, for each one of us. Amen. And, and I, it, it really does excite me about, the, you know, you not only just talk about God, but you experience God. You experience God in the place where you work. You experience God in your homes. You you know, our, our localities are changed because of the presence of the living God. And I have read so much about revivals, actually, to inspire me, but to frustrate me as well. And because, you know, when you think of the Welsh revival, you know, how God so moved, but it only started because people began to, began to pray. And, but the whole um, area, and it actually went global, began to be transformed because God came. And there's this beautiful scripture in Habakkuk chapter 2. It was a prayer, and I love what I think one of the translations said, and I wonder if this is how you pray. It was a prayer that was set to wild, triumphant music. <laughs> how about that for a prayer meeting? Yeah. Amen. <laughs> and I had been in some prayer meetings like that, and, and forgetting about what even neighbors or what others may think. You know, a wild, triumphant music. And the, and, the, and the prayer was, oh God, oh God, revive your work and make yourself known. And we talked a wee bit about this yesterday. Oh God, why do I want to behold my God? I want to be able to believe in him. I want to be able to receive from him. I want to be able to remain steadfast to him. Oh God, revive your work in the midst of the years and make yourself known. That no longer are we talking about a God of miracles. We are talking about experiencing miracles. And that they're not just something in a book, but there's something that God is so quickening and, and causing us to believe for. And um, and and I just really, as I re as I 
read more about this, the Psalm 85. Oh, will you revive us again, that your people may rejoice in you. Show us your unfailing love. Oh, God, grant us your salvation. And one of the, uh, I mentioned this yesterday, again, too, one of the aspects of their walk with God was the incredible, unspeakable joy. Yeah. Is that what people feel when they come into the house of the Lord? Is that what they feel about you? I mean, I don't think um, my Peter was one who was always was incredibly joyful and I was more reserved. And sometimes he would like we'd go out for a walk and um, and, and we'd be walking along there and all of a sudden he had disappeared. And I used to get so frustrated because I think Peter and what he had done, he would go off in a backtrack and he would go away and hide and he expected me to come and find him. <laughs> and I thought, no, I'm out here for a walk. And so I would sit down and finally he kind of said, Anne, why didn't you come and find me? And then he said, you're no fun. <laughs> and I thought, so, yeah, and you're no fun. <laughs> Actually, quite boring. <laughs> but just that sense of um, joy, that just that sense of expressiveness, just that. And God wants, you know, he wants you to know what it is, that there's so much to be enjoyed when he begins to pour out his spirit on all flesh. Now, I wanted to um, actually <laughs> read a scripture, amazing one, which we all aim for, and you know it so well, but in Acts chapter 2, this was the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, and they think, okay, God, what kind of a church do we really want to be? And I'm just going to just highlight several scriptures here. When the day of Pentecost was being fulfilled, and I'm reading from the Passion Translation, all of the disciples were gathered in one place. Suddenly they heard the sound of a violent blast of wind. I love the dramatic of the violent, the radical, the wild. And you get this over here in the coast. <laughs> Rushing into the house from out of the heavenly realm. And hear this. And the roar... This was no little whisper. The roar of the wind was so overpowering, it was all everyone could hear. Then all at once, a pillar of fire appeared before them. It separated into tongues of fire that engulfed each of them. They were all filled and equipped with the Holy Spirit. And they were inspired to speak in tongues, empowered by the Spirit to speak in the languages they had never learnt. And then it goes on to say, you know, what really happened as many, many worshippers saw the wonderful wonders of our God. And they said, what is this phenomena? Verse 13. But others poked fun of them and said they must have been drunk. Okay, what does that look like? I think a few of them lost their dignity. <laughs> we won't go into that. But then Peter stood up. And he shouted to the crowd, listen carefully. This is the fulfillment of what God prophesied through the Joel for now. This is what I will do in these last days. I will pour out my spirit on everyone. And I will cause your sons and your daughters to prophesy. And your young men will see visions and your old men will dream dreams. And everyone, and then it goes on to say about the amazing things that God was going to do. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Yeah. And then he preaches the powerful message of Jesus Christ, the one who you crucified, but the one who you crucified, he is in fact the victorious one that has been appointed by my sons. And he talks about the wonderful resurrection. And then he goes on, oh, right, I'm, I'm actually going right down, I'm at to verse 38, you wouldn't believe it already. <laughs> I hope you will read this for yourself. But you know, everyone know for certain 
that this Jesus that we speak about, this Jesus that we preach about, whom you have crucified, is the one that God hath made Lord and Messiah. And I believe God is truly opening up our eyes. We know about Jesus, but God is wanting us to experience Jesus in greater dimensions of his love. And as, as Mike has already alluded to, and we spoke about it yesterday that he wants to not only be our savior he not only wants to be our lord but he wants to bring us into divine partnership with him where literally i become his bride and who whatever woman doesn't want to be a bride and then he peter goes on to say they were so deeply moved the people and another cry came from my heart and they said wow what do we need to do and Peter said, repent and return to God. For each one of you must be baptized and have your sins removed. Then take hold of the gift of the Holy Spirit. For this promise is for you and your families, for those yet to be born, and for everyone whom the Lord God calls to himself. I have already told my grandchildren who are not even in relationships yet that I've prayed for their children and I've prayed for their children's children and they're saying, wait a tick, Grandma, wait a tick. But the scriptures encourage us that we can actually pray for generations to come. And I believe we are a product of many people who have prayed for us who we will never know. That's why God has so wonderfully, wonderfully moved. And so as I read that account in the book of Acts, I don't know what comes to your mind. I hope there's a sense of wonder. I hope there's a sense of what a mighty God who said. And I hope there's a sense, oh God, like Habakkuk prayed, oh God, do it again, do it again, do it again. But I also want to come back to the reality of it because 55 days a little earlier, they weren't, the disciples were anything but ready for such a move of God. And what was the problem? They had issues. They had issues. And Mike said before, are any of you facing challenges? I don't know if anyone put your hands up. Maybe we should help you. <laughs> Do you have issues? Does anyone not have an issue today? <laughs> And what was some, so I want to take you back to just what was happening amidst the disciples just before the days of, of the crucifixion. And, you know, where they, they had actually avowed that they would follow, follow the Lord all through um, every step. Like when um, Peter, Jesus said to Peter, he said, Peter, you are going to deny me. And, um, and Peter rises up, no way, Lord, I will follow you all the days of my life, whether it means going through prison or whether it goes through death. No way will I ever defy you because they were beginning to get a sense of change. And when you are being discomforted, where God is taking you out of comfort zones, out of the familiar, out of what you had hoped had happened, you begin to feel different on your heart, don't you? And the disciples are beginning to think, wow, they were getting a little unnerved. And so what was emerging out of that was another conversation that the disciples were having. Actually, the Passion Bible says they began bickering one with the other. And the bickering was all about who was going to be the next leader. Who is going to be the one that we will follow or who will lead us? And how that they, they must have had that conversation with their mother Zebedee because she goes to Jesus and says, when you come to your kingdom, make sure you give my, boy, my boys, my boys, a place of prominence, one on the left and one on the right. And Jesus said, oh, oh, oh lady, that's not my place to give you that. But this was going the internal issues that some of the disciples were really, really facing. What about the time when um, Jesus was uh, actually in the garden and what well, actually no before that? What about the time when Jesus began that he said, let's go and have a Passover meal. And they were actually going to have this Passover meal and Jesus was finally getting to them and said, this is the last time I'm going to have this with you. 
And what does Jesus do? Absolutely astoundingly, as they're having this, this communion service, and the disciples are watching Jesus, and he begins to get up from the table, and he disrobes, and then he goes over to the servant's um, quarter, and he picks up a towel, and he picks up a basin, and they're thinking, oh my goodness, what is he going to do? Oh my goodness, what did we forget to do? These are my lozenges. I have this sore throat every now and again. <laughs> and, um, and because normally when you come into a place, no one wanted to be the lowest servant of all. No one wanted to be the washer of feet. No one wanted to be there to encourage one another. No one wanted to be there to refresh the other. So they come into this Passover feast and Jesus notices and he begins to say, as the disciple thought, oh no, he's going to wash our feet. And if those of you have ever been in foot washing services, it's amazing yeah. the issues that come up in your heart. The issues of, and I could so identify with Peter because he comes to Peter and, he's, and the Lord says, um, as he begins to take Peter, and Peter stands up. If he wasn't standing up literally, he sure was on the inside. And he was saying, you will never, never wash my feet. <sighs> okay, Peter. And I think the Lord just takes him and says, it's okay, Peter, but I want you to know, if you don't allow me to do this, you will have no part in my kingdom. What he was saying, Peter, this is more important for you today than what you will ever know at this moment. Because he was preparing them to be a people of influence like they had never experienced in their lives before. He was preparing them for that Acts chapter 2 where they knew what it was to wash one another's feet. Where they knew what it wasn't position that was the thing that was the issue. It was that they would know what it was to be a servant of all. And I think that's one of my life's messages, really. The greatest call is to be a servant. And I stand here, maybe you see me as a minister, but underneath my foundation and my grid is I long to be here to serve you. I long to be here to be able to impart to you the bread of life, which is the life and the ministry of Jesus Christ. And um, I often remember um, a definition of, of, a, of a big shot. And do you know what a big shot is? A little shot away from home. <laughs> so true. So true. And sometimes you can get enamoured by someone who's up here speaking and little realising we're only here because of the gifting and the grace of God. And he's given us the awesome privilege of being able to serve. And even in, in coming to Grandma, my heart's cry, Lord, I want to so serve to them a greater revelation and the wonder of the bread of life, the person of Jesus Christ, the reality of him, the wonder of him. And I still marvel about this. So these disciples... They had issues. Does that help you? They had issues. What about coming into the garden <laughs> and with the priests? And they said there was about 500 in that army that came to arrest Jesus. Wow, what did they have in mind? And as they come in the darkness and, and uh, Judas leading them, and Jesus says, who have you come for? What's all this about? He said, we've come to arrest Jesus. He said, well, here am I. And one of Jesus' disciples who had issues, probably Peter, gets up and was so indignant and so adamant about what was happening that he gets up and he slices off the ear of the chief priest's servant. Well, that could have caused a riot. And what does Jesus do? He says, hold on, Peter, hold on, Peter. He gets the, picks up the ear and puts it back on the servant and heals him. I think, oh, my God. <laughs> I don't think I would have been doing that. I would have had issues, lots of them. 
And yet, it was such a traumatic time for the disciples. Wow. Because even after the, after the crucifixion, the disappointment that they faced. Well, I've given my life to follow you, Jesus. We had a promise that things would be different than this. Even though Jesus had tried to explain it to them, they never fully grasped it. And so they decided, and it looks like Peter again was the leader, he said, I'm going back to where I was comfortable. I'm going back to fishing. I know how to fish. I know how to do that. I've done that all my life. So he goes back to that. And it seems like he took all of the other disciples with him because when it came to the crucifixion, I don't know where they were because except to say that G, uh, Peter was the one who had denied Christ. And, and so he was, uh, he was a, a, a mixture of issues because he had denied the, the Lord. He had hidden. And when it came to the cross, there was only one disciple there, and that was John. And I want to commend the women. <laughs> the women were there. And so... They come to this place where they've, Peter says, okay, guys, let's go back to fishing. Oh, and I just so love John 21. Because, the, again, the disciples, all this had happened, they were traumatized, they were disappointed, they didn't know where life was going to take them, and then they hear from the women initially that Jesus had risen from the dead. Well, where does that put them? And in spite of all of that, they go back to what they knew they could do. <laughs> I wonder if you were Jesus, what you would have thought of them? What would you have, how would you have thought, I've given you guys three years and this is the plan I have for my church. And look at you now. You've all got these issues. And they're out in this boat. And they've been fishing and, and there's no fish. And there's a voice comes from the shoreline. And it's Jesus and he's saying to them, Hey, how's it going? And I'm sure they're thinking, who on earth is he and what does he think he knows? And so, as they're going, they said, we haven't caught anything. He says, well, put the net on the other side. And they put the net on the other side and the hall was so great, was so amazing. And all of a sudden, John said to Peter, I think it's the Lord. It is the Lord. And I love what Peter's response is, despite of his issues, despite of his disappointments, despite of his failure um, and his, his denial, he literally jumps out of the boat and swims ahead to meet Jesus. And he arrives, and is Jesus there to condemn him? And I mentioned this yesterday because I thought this was amazing. Here is Jesus in the midst of a, a disciples with all these issues. And he does the most normal and the most natural thing to meet with them. He sets up a barbecue and meets them on the beach. No big reprimand. No big session of now what do you, who do you think you are? He said he just came to relate to them and to restore them back to himself. And over the next few days, he began to settle amazing issues. But I am just so amazed that today, God, we pray for revival. We pray for God to move mightily. And he is. But in preparing the way, he's dealing with issues. I mean, I'd rather read about revival, wouldn't you? 
I'd rather read about the excitement of it, especially when, when in, um, with some of the revivals that happened, even the, when they came into some of the harbors, even, even miles out from actually reaching their destination, the conviction of the Holy Spirit would so come upon the people in the boats that they, by the time they came to shore, they were already weeping and crying out to God, Oh God, forgive us! Because with revival, we hear about all the joy, we hear about the wonder, we hear about the transformation, but preceding that is God convicts us of our sin. And you know the scriptures so well. If my people, what is that? You tell me. Called by my name, shall what? Humble themselves, then what do? Pray. Turn from your wicked ways. Then I will hear from heaven and heal your land. I want to say to you, when are you persuaded that your ways are wicked if you've been following God? It's not until you come into his presence. You come into the sense of his holiness. And his presence isn't to just it doesn't condemn you, but to convict you so that you can be healed and can be restored. <clears throat> I have been in some amazing sessions where the presence of God and we've been crying out to God. There was a season we were so crying out God for revival. And, and all around, we, we were in several conferences. One, there were leadership conferences. And one particularly was... Um, it, they were national ones, but what was interesting was everybody else seemed to get incredible encounters except me. You ever feel like that? Oh, God, what's wrong with me? How come I don't get those depths? And I went from one conference to the next one, and at the same time I was saying, but God, I'm really happy for them, with a big question mark. <laughs> And I really love the fact that you're blessing them. I really want, and I, and I thank you that you're answering prayers. But, oh, God, I would have loved to have such a touch. And we were in one night. It's still very real to me. And we were singing that amazing song, Jesus, Jesus, there's something wonderful about your name. And, and, we were, and as we were singing it, and we were worshipping, all of a sudden God convicted me of an area of pride in my life. And I rebuked it and I said, oh, I rebuke you, Satan, for taking my eyes off Jesus and, and, allow, and showing me this area of my sin. And it, and it kept coming, it wouldn't go away. And then I felt anointed or quickened and I thought, hoo hoo, what's this? And so I said to the Lord, um, I'll talk about it to you later. And we'll get this right. And the Lord said, I think we'll talk about it now. But I'm in, in leading a conference and we're worshipping. And the worship leader saying, Anne, what are we doing? I said, just keep on singing. Just keep on singing. Because I felt the Lord was, and I said to the Lord, well, what do you want me to do with it? He said, I want you to confess it. And I said, yeah, I will talk to you about it. He said, no, I want you to confess it at the conference because it relates to that. And all of a sudden I was so nervous. And I wasn't nervous about what people would think. I was nervous that it might be something that just falls to the ground and not really be meaningful. And finally I got spoke to the song leader and I said, look, I really feel I have to share. And I just shared of the wonder of God when we ask for revival when we ask for an outpouring of the Spirit, do you know what he does? He clears the decks. It seems like there's times he prepares our hearts because when he outpours his Spirit, he doesn't, and you would know this, the water, flood waters can absolutely destroy or they can replenish. But if the ground is not prepared, what happens when the flood waters come? They are devastating. They bring damage. And it's the same with the spirit of the living God. If they, God can pour out his spirit and it can just go over hard, rocky soil and not penetrate or do anything to transform. 
But if God, will, if we allow God to make our hearts soft, and I think this is what he was doing. And so what it does, it's like we make the valley full of ditches. We say, oh God, prepare my heart for what I know you're going to do. And so as I began to finally say, okay, Father, it doesn't matter what people say. The most important thing is that I be obedient to you. And I began to confess in, in this area of pride related to the conferences. And I asked for their apologies. And as I did that, I, God gave me a vision of what my sin did for Jesus at Calvary. And I said it wasn't, it was my sin that put him there to Calvary. It was my sin that caused him to go through all of that. And I just said, oh God, I am so, so sorry. And I began to weep profusely. And I ended up in a crumbled mess on the platform. And I thought, oh my God. And then after a while, I wanted to get off, but my feet had, my legs had gone to sleep. So I had to stay there. I was a spectacle. I thought, oh God, <laughs> is he still so kind? But you know, that broke open a meeting that went on to one or two in the morning as people began to get their lives right with God because God wants to deal with issues. God doesn't want you to go around encumbered God doesn't want you to go around with offences. God doesn't want you to go around feeling all of these, these, these issues. He wants you to know what it is to be clean. And there were several pastors' wives who couldn't relate to all of this. So they went up to a mezzanine floor, and what happened to them, they began to laugh and laugh and laugh. So while people downstairs, people were getting right with God, there was reconciliations, there was amazing things happening, there was healings, they were laughing, and then they thought, oh, oh, what's wrong with us? And the speaker that we had said, all of you are an expression of what heaven is feeling about what's happening down here. Because it said, all of heaven rejoices when one sinner repenteth. And, you know, um, it was just, talk about an, an, a mixture of emotions. As issues were healed, as relationships were, there was reconciliations, it was just a beautiful move of the Holy Spirit, which ushered in a tremendous move. And, and I just thought, and the next morning though, I woke up and I thought, I went to the speaker, I said, I'm not going to lead this conference anymore. I didn't feel worthy. And she said, yes, you will. They now know that you are a cleansed sinner. <laughs> <laughs> and that speaks for all of us, isn't it? We are sinners saved by the precious blood of Jesus Christ. And so issues were settled. But you know, the thing that I really wanted to get to today This always, when God said, I'm going to pour out my rain, I'm going to pour out my spirit. There's always the thing, and this is what I experienced in my family. Uh, we grew up in an Anglican church. I was in church five times on a Sunday in an Anglican church. My mother and dad used to say, why don't you just go and make your bed there? But the thing was, God had put such a hunger in my heart. And then I met up with some wonderful people and I went to a Baptist church. Because my family, we were a close family, but they wanted me to be normal. <laughs> Whatever that looks like. And, and so I went to the Baptist church and there was, um, I, I was still keeping relating to the situation that I was in. And met some wonderful people, young people who were on fire for God. And I tell you, I became part of an amazing group of young people. We went to Youth for Christ. And then I got involved with another group of young people in Youth for Christ who were Pentecostals, who got filled with the Holy Spirit. And then all of a sudden my parents were saying, no, just stay with the Baptists. Just stay with the Baptists. Just stay with the Baptists. <laughs> And then I got involved with the Pentecostals. And then, this is what Alison was alluding to, and then I not only got involved with the Pentecostals, but I met Peter. And he was wanting to marry me, the Pentecostal pastor. So can you imagine the stress that I was to my parents? 
and just stay here. This will be, this is, but I tell you when God puts something in your heart, you cannot just stay here. Amen. He always gives you a choice, as Elijah did with Elisha. Elisha, Elijah kept saying, no, just stay here. He said, oh, no, I've got my eyes on the promise of God. And I think God wants to put in each one of your hearts and, and, and the, the reality of the promise, the reality of the vision, so that when people say, just stay here, just be normal. Oh, no, because there's something burning within my heart. There's such a conviction. And I just love the, the wonderful fact that when God calls you to not only be his saviour, to be your father, his wonderful father, but he's called you into an army. And I think this is what God is saying is he's raising up a bride, but she's a bride in combat boots, not little Cinderella slippers. And I just love this Proverbs 31. I know it's a woman's nightmare. But it's a wonderful picture of the bride of Christ. But I love what the Passion Bible brought out. This virtuous woman, can I tell you this? It's often, this virtue word means, it's often connected with military prowlessness. This is a warring wife. It can be translated mighty, wealthy, excellent, morally righteous, full of substance, integrity, ability, strength, mighty like an army. I tell you, this bride of Christ is not a pushover. She's not, and actually I know when Peter, um, when we were courting, he always thought I, that I was um, a gentle person. And every now and again he would say, I had no idea you could be so strong. <laughs> we all surprise one another, don't we? <laughs> he said, I had no idea. But the thing was, it wasn't a natural strength. It was what God puts into me by the Holy Spirit. And, you know, she, and so this, this dear leader, she's not apologetic about her strengths. She's not apologetic about who she is. She's strong in her convictions. And I just really believe that the army that God's raising, it's not like Dad's army, but you know that, and, and you see this in the book of, of the Psalms with David, you know, he bought, and this is one of the passions of my late husband, was that there was the men, all these men that, that came together in the cave of Adullam, over 400. They were discouraged. They were discontented. They were in debt. They had issues, lots and lots of issues. But what under, under um, David's leadership, what did he do? Oh, he challenged their issues. He trained and equipped them so that they were expert in war. They were not of double heart. They could keep rank. And they drew up a battle formation which was absolutely amazing. And I just truly believe that I, I, I feel... Um, um, I feel excited about what God's doing on the coast. I really, really do. And, you know, sometimes the thing that came to my mind is that so often you feel in the backwash or that you are insignificant. And that's what the enemy wants to feel. Like It's a bit like David with Goliath. Like he could have lost the battle even before he got to Goliath because his brothers said to him, who do you think you are? They doubted his reservation. Why have you come up here? And who and and his capabilities. And he didn't hear all of those offences because more real to him. Who is this uncircumcised uh, giant that dares to defy the armies of the living God? And you might be. A, and, and I'm telling you, God wants to put a spirit of strength within you that it's not according to your personality. It's according to the spirit of the Lord coming upon you and you know what it is to rise up with this indignation are you indignant about what's happening in our nation are you indignant about what's happening in our schools are you indignant what's happening with your children are you indignant of the future that it seems to loom up I trust God will put with you in that spirit of, spirit of a warrior. And it's in that, when where do you exercise that? And it's that place of prayer. I want to say to you, it's no more sweet grandma prayers. 
It's actually laying a hold of what God has said. And, 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 and we're looking for miracles. I know what that's like too. You know, as I went through a cancer situation and, um, and, and I thought, you know, what do you do when you get news like that? Well, I went through my house and cleaned out all the disaster areas first. And then I would march up and down my yarn and say, Father, I thank you for the power of God to overcome and to heal this cancer. And But deep down in my heart was the confession, I will be the mother of my five children. And I will be the husband of Peter. I didn't want anyone else to have him. But, uh, but the thing was, I will be, and I marched up and down like, an, uh, like I was in the army. You can settle for a diagnosis or you can get up and you begin to declare the word of the living God. What is God's word? So get into the word. Find out what his promises are. Don't tap them in the back of your Bible. Begin to decree. Begin to declare. This is my God. This is what his word says. This is his word for the, for the West Coast. This is his word for New Zealand. And begin to to wage a good warfare. And I just really thank you. I love this verse here, and this is my closing one. Psalm, Proverbs 21, 22. A warrior filled with wisdom ascends into the high places and releases regional breakthrough, breaking down the strongholds of the enemy. And then in Proverbs 11, the blessing that resists on the righteous releases strength and favor to the entire city and region. And Lord, I really thank you, Father, that the blessing that rests on this house, that rests upon your people on this on this coast, Father, it brings strength and favor to Greymouth. It brings strength and favor to Hokitika. It brings strength and favor to Reefton. It brings strength and favor to every region, every region in this West Coast. And we thank you, Father, that you've called us to be catalysts. Oh, God, to see your glory, revival absolutely explode in this place in the powerful name of Jesus Christ. And we will see the salvation of souls. We will see that harvest. We will see the miracles. We will see people say, oh, the wonder of our God. It is Jesus Christ. Wow, wow, wow. That's why he gives us the Holy Spirit. Goliath said, give me a man. And Jesus said, I scan the whole earth looking for a man or a woman who will come and pray and ask of me. And so that's my challenge. Will you be one as God? Can you imagine the Spirit of the Lord scanning the whole earth, the Spirit of the Lord scanning the West Coast, looking, searching for a man or a woman who will come and stand in the gap? For any mighty move of God is always preceded by that place of corporate prayer. As in Acts chapter 2, when they were assembled together and as they prayed, the Holy Spirit came in Jesus' name. Will you be that man? Will you be that woman? In this incredible age, in this incredible day, in this incredible year, where God is supernaturally pouring out his spirit on all flesh. And I say to Lord, I've put my hand up. I've put my hand up. Not only to hear about it, not only to be inspired by it, but to be a partaker of it. In Jesus' wonderful name. Amen.